I cover the Nebraska area. So we're going to go over some arc flash and some panel safety. You guys are out in the field a lot. You're going into different facilities. You're exposed to a lot of different equipment. And what I want you to do is be aware of your surroundings out there. This isn't supposed to scare you or anything like that. It's just supposed to make you more aware of what's going on so that should something happen in the field, um, you're protected. So we're going to talk about arc flash safety for electrical panels. Uh, we go out there, people open panels for us all the time. I just want you to be aware of when they open it, how they open it, how to position yourself and where they're at. And then we're going to cover some of the categories for PPE safety here. Some of the things to know before opening an electrical panel. What is the arc flash level identified on the panel label? You may or may not see any uh, labels out there on the panels. All right, so we don't know what the arc flash is. We don't know what the incoming voltage is, and we don't know what the fault current is. So could it be a significant uh, event? Yes. Most of the time in the field, whenever we have an arc flash event, there is something moving. If everything's powered up and everything's running fine, arc flashes are very rare. However, once we start opening panels and doing that, then we expose ourselves to an arc flash hazard. Okay. Oops. All right, so these are the panels, uh, some of the labeling you're going to see on the panels. The warning over here is no longer allowed. Number one, it does not say anything about the caloric level or what your PPE level is required to be in a certain area within that. So the generic one doesn't have any uh, machine specific analysis on it. It is not compliant and there was no case study done to put that on the panel. They just basically walked up and stuck it on the panel door. Um, the warning, the older one there in the middle, uh, you see it states category number one. It gives you uh, one to five uh, inches of flash hazard boundary and it also uh, customer flash hazard is 18 inches or cows per centimeter squared flash hazard is 18 inches. So that one is still valid. It is older but because it does late state the PPE level on it then it's good. The last one over there is danger arc flash and shock hazard appropriate PPE required. It gives you the calories per centimeter squared and it gives you the distance there and it's pretty well stated. So if we're at 10 cals uh, per centimeter squared, what level is that? What should we be wearing in the field when we're around that equipment? Okay, because when we open a cabinet door, how close do we get? Pretty close to the equipment, correct? So just be aware of that when you're out there. If there's not a label, what is the voltage and current availability within the panel? We don't know. Maybe the individual taking you around the facility knows, but we don't know for a fact. We're going to assume it could be 480, it could be 208, it could be some other level. Okay, so anything over 50 volts is considered high voltage. Yeah, th again, we're talking low voltage up 600 volts, and then you get to medium voltage, 2700, 4160, correct? According to NFPA 70E, Anything over 50 volts is considered high voltage. Anybody know the reasoning behind that? It is a let go threshold. So when the human body gets hooked up with electrical and they start hanging on to it, it's going to cause your muscles to contract. So anything over 50 volts is where our body can no longer override that impulse to correct it and let go. Okay, so that's basically what that cutoff is. When they first come out, they stated it at 49 volts, and that's been quite a few years ago, but they have changed it up to 50 volts. Okay. The other thing we need to be, be concerned about, what is the overcurrent protective device upstream? Is it a breaker? Is it fuses? Does it have a maintenance mode? What is the purpose of a maintenance mode? Okay. So basically, a maintenance mode is designed to reduce the arc flash uh, incident level in that area below that breaker. So if I've got a main circuit breaker and an M uh, MCC, I can turn that into the maintenance mode. Everything downstream of that reduces to a lower level of arc flash incident energy. Okay. With this one, we're sitting here. We've got electrical feeder bus up above. We've got conduit from the feeder bus down to panel A. It says, while working in panel A, can you be exposed to an arc flash hazard? If the disconnect is off in panel A, are we exposed? Absolutely we are. Just because this is off does not mean there cannot be a fault in that bus. And that fault can propagate down the conduit 
and out the front of that panel while we're standing in front of it. So we are exposed, okay? And even if it isn't a breaker, um, if we disconnect the breaker up on the bus to shut that off, we're still exposed in that panel because there still is that bus work coming down. The arc flash and blast doesn't care. It's going to propagate in all directions, okay, until it meets resistance. Now, I've got a video coming up. I want you to watch the four-inch duct above the panel um, after the arc flash event coming up. Okay, a couple things we need to be looking at. How close are we going to be to the panel? When, we, when they open a panel for us to look inside to see a part number or something like that on the piece of equipment, we're going to get pretty close to that equipment, correct? So what I'm trying to prevent and do is know your limitations, know what's out there, because what I don't have to do, don't want to do is have anybody be exposed to a event that will leave a permanent impression on them. I've had several of those uh, that have happened in my lifetime. Uh, one was on a 4160 panel for another individual. He did not survive. And one was my own fault with a 230 volt DC mag cord lead that I generated the arc fault myself when cutting the lead in half. Okay, that was a big enough uh, blue arc for people to come running from about 40 feet in elevation above me and about 45 feet away from it. And they come running over to see what the arc flash event was. Um, we come out of there, me and my partner come out of there with no eyebrows, um, seeing stars for quite a while, and that left a pretty good impression on me. But the 4161 was really a bad deal. It was a very young contractor um, at a facility I worked at, and I don't want anybody else to have to deal with that. That leaves a hell of an impression on your, on your life. So I'm trying to avoid that. A couple things is there are four different types of approach boundaries in the standard. We have a limited approach boundary. Unqualified persons must be escorted. When we're out there in the field, are we qualified in any of these places we go into? Absolutely not. We're not qualified individuals. There'll be some electricians in that um, that are qualified, and they might have limitations over to what uh, capabilities of various maintenance people in the facility are. Some will be qualified, some are authorized, things like that. Restricted approach boundary. Unqualified persons are not allowed, so that means we can't go into the boundary. Okay? We need to take that into consideration should we go into that or be allowed into there because most of the time we're basically in street clothes. We have some sort of a denim on um, and we have some sort of a shirt. Could be a cotton shirt. If it's a shirt like this material, like that uh, dry wicking like that, they will melt. Okay? And if you ever had hot plastic on you and had to pull hot plastic off you, you know how fun that is? Well, when a shirt melts to you, it's going to be the same thing. Okay? So anything with rayon, nylon, or anything like that, don't wear these out in the field. Prohibit approach boundaries. Safe work practices required by qualified persons. Okay, so these are the people you got to be knowing what you're doing to go into there. So if we're open a panel, we're going to do, be doing troubleshooting or something like that on equipment. This is what kind of what we're looking for. And then we get the flash protection boundary. Now we're talking sometimes up to maybe uh, 12 feet, or it could be down as far as you know maybe six, seven inches, or three inches, depending on what's available. So this is the arc flash protection required. This boundary is calculated using the available fault current and clearing time for the upstream tripping device. So when we get into an arc event, there's a couple of things we can do. Through equipment, we can somewhat limit current. Okay, peak let through current. The other thing we can manage is time. So one cycle at 60 hertz is about 16 milliseconds. So we have a lot of equipment out there now, fusing end breakers that are going to trip uh, in 7 to 12 milliseconds. Okay, so we're getting half to three quarters of a cycle. Some of the equipment that we put in there that help mitigate arc flash take seven milliseconds to respond. So we take the tripping hazard of, or the tripping time of a breaker or a fuse and we tie in this other uh, piece of equipment to monitor for arc faults within the system and we have to add seven milliseconds to it. So now we've added another half cycle to it. And when current uh, basically becomes an arc. Um, it doesn't take long for that to expand and generate a lot of force in a hurry. Uh, just to give you an idea, copper expands at 67,000 times. I believe water, when vaporized, expands 12 to 1400 times. And everybody says, oh, that's a heck of an explosion. Um, but the copper explosion is several times worse. Temperatures in an arc event can be up to 35,000 degrees. All right, obviously they only last for a very short period of time, providing the upstream tripping device 
uh, works effectively, but you're still seeing extreme temperatures. So you're seeing debris, in, debris from shrapnel with things coming apart, and that's coming out, uh, could be inhaled in that. Because what's the first response when something happens to an individual out in the field? You have an explosion of that. The first thing you do is go, <gasps> inhale really bad and you take all that hot gas and air into your lungs and it uh, generates some problems. These are different categories of personal protective equipment. We got category zero which is basically street clothes. That's pretty much what we're in a lot of times. You got category one which is four cals per centimeter squared. So basically you've got, uh, we'll go through what's covered, but you got denim jeans. This is similar to what we're going to be in a lot in the field. Okay, long sleeve shirt of some natural fiber probably blue jeans, uh, boots, safety glasses, hard hat, and hearing protection, okay? But we're still very limited. Then we step up to the category two, which we're at eight cows per centimeter, so it's becoming a little heavy fa heavier fabric, okay? Then we get a 25 cal uh, suit there, significantly lighter than the 40 cal suit. Um, the 40 cal suit is not what you want to be into in the middle of a steel mill in July when it's about 105 degrees out. That's not the most comfortable uh, equipment and it's sometimes cumbersome to work on. You got your insulated leather gloves, rubber gloves, your leather gloves over the top, you've got all your PPE underneath and then you've got this suit over the top of you as well. So multiple layers. So basically the protection there is layers. Uh, most of this uh, PPE out there now is made out of Nomex which is a man-made material. Uh, basically the reason they use that is it doesn't continue to burn when the flame's been removed from it. So it does not continue to burn. So category zero, uh, non-melting untreated natural fiber, wool, rayon, or silk, or blends of these with a fabric weight of at least 4.5 ounces per yard. Uh, shirt sleeve, long shirt sleeve, pants, safety glasses, goggles, hearing protection, heavy duty leather gloves as needed. Category one, we got long, uh, arc rated long sleeve shirt and pants, arc rated coveralls, arc rated face shield or arc flash suit hood, arc rated jacket, parka rainwear, hard hat liner. Okay, so again, the higher the level do, the more protection we have to have between us because all we can do is create layers between us and the arc flash incident. Uh, obviously, we still need protective uh, hard hat, safety glasses, hearing protection, heavy duty work gloves, and leather work shoes. Category two, we still need the shirt and pants, uh, suit hood or arc-rated face shield and arc-rated balaclava, which is basically the hood, okay? And we need um, arc-rated jacket, parka, rainwear, hard hat liner. Hard hat, safety glasses, so a lot of these are still the same from over to over. Now, the one thing you need to remember is in your uh, boots, if they're steel toe boots, you'll see a lot of them out there you know, they've, had, they've been on there working and they've rubbed the toes off and you actually see the steel uh, protective device in the boot. Well, if somebody's working on a piece of equipment and they have their feet down, they're like on their hands and knees or something like that, and they have that foot down, that basically grounds them even better than just uh, through their body, through the knees and things like that. So that's kind of an interesting event. Um, so make sure your shoes and stuff like that are in a decent order and well maintained. And then category four, this is a 40 cal suit, uh, long sleeve shirt, arc pants, arc credit coveralls, arc credit flash suit jacket, uh, flash suit pants, flash suit hood, arc credit gloves, uh, arc credit jacket, parka rainwear, hard hat liner. So you are in full uh, dress when we get into this area. Again, it's uh, very dark, it's very hard to work in that. Um, sometimes people say it almost creates an unsafe environment, uh, creates more of a chance for you to make a mistake than not. Um, but you know, the idea is that everybody leaves in the same condition they showed up in. That's the name of the game. That's what it's all about. Before touching a panel, verify with inductive voltage tester the panel is not energized. How many people have reached out? Grab the panel. Okay. Do you know if there's uh, le voltage leakage to ground? We don't know that. Are they monitoring ground fault current? We don't know that, okay? Um, when I was an instructor at the college, we had several companies come in and their process was, oh, just reach out and lay the back of your hand on a 480 volt panel and see if it's de-energized. Well, that's fine and dandy. Number one, you won't get locked onto the panel because 
you're not grabbing the panel, okay? But the only other problem is if you lay your hand, back of your hand on a panel and things are just right, the current flow is going to be through your arm, through your body, and out your feet. All right? Can that kill you if conditions are correct? Yes, it can, and it has. So uh, some of the industry have changed the standards. This is an inductive type device. Um, they're fairly reasonably priced. Um, they're not life or death. I wouldn't stick my li life on this and say, hey, this is what's going to work and protect me from that. That's what a meter's for. However, can I take this up and run it up next to a panel and see if there's any energy or voltage on that panel without touching it? So it's a good idea. So again, people are going to open a panel and things like that. Pay attention to how the panel opens because if we do get an arc event, that door is going to swing open. Okay. Uh, like I said, the one major arc event event I had on the 4160 that I was involved with, five things lined up just perfect for this to happen. Uh, it all started by basically a ground being broken loose. So the ground wire swung loose and ran into the one phase of the 4160, which caused a phase of ground fault. And then it changed to a phase to phase fault through the gas ionization. And we had a heck of an explosion. Um, on the wall in the facility that I was at, you can still see the outline of the individual uh, on the wall. They haven't painted over it yet. So just something to think about because it does leave a heck of an imprint. You do get a heck of a blast out of there. They can go up to a thousand pounds per square inch out of one of these blasts. So if any sp high school sports, college sports people have been hit by somebody, um, hard or punched by somebody, um, that's, li mi that's minor compared to what you'll get out of an arc event. This video, um, pay attention to the four inch duct up here. This is basically in a 120-208 panel. It is a bolted fault across a single phase uh, breaker to ground, okay? Whoops. Uh, what's going on play? Now, on that, you can see that panel comes up up here, and that's what hits him in the head. And that's what basically rocks him. So when you're out there, be aware of what you're, what's around you, where you're at, what you're exposed to. And that's all I got. Anybody have any questions? Awesome. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, when you're out there, be, be aware, be safe. Make sure you're in the proper area if somebody's going to swing open a panel door or a bucket on an MCC or anything like that. Make sure you position yourself so that at least you've got the door between you and the blast so that if it does happen, it propagates away from you. Okay. Um, now You might have to render aid to the individual that opened the door, but preferably you don't get uh, involved in the arc event. That's all I got. Most arc flashes happen right as the door is being opened, or is it once they're digging around in the panel? Not necessarily. Uh, they could at any time. Once that door starts to swing open, um, like I said, the arc event we had was there was because there was a ground on the door. And when they swung the door open, things happened, and basically the ground broke loose and could swing around. So at any point through that door opening, you could have an arc event. Anytime you take a piece of troubleshooting equipment, it could be a screwdriver or voltmeter or anything like that, and you start uh, inserting that into the equipment, the chances of an arc fall through there, okay? So that's what um, a lot of the maintenance people and things like that are trained on, um, how to do that, how to troubleshoot that, but we don't necessarily have the training that they have out there in the field, so, you know, let them do their job, stay away, make sure you have a way out, okay, that you're not involved with the fault. Anything else? All right, thank you for your time.